Welcome and thank you for joining HCM's call with Doug Johnson and Mike Hanghold. Today is June 18th. On this call, Doug and Mike will discuss the recent market moves and positioning and give an assessment of the economic conditions as states continue to normalize activity. They will also give their thoughts on the possibility of a COVID second wave. Your lines are muted. We ask that you please keep your lines muted and send your questions into our um, info email box at info at hcmwealthadvisors.com. We will address any questions that come in through our email as best as we can during this call. We're going to try to keep it to around 30 minutes. Um, with the topics today, it may run a little longer, but we will do our best to keep it at 30 minutes. I will now turn this call over to Mike and Doug. Mike? Thanks, Maureen. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to our call. It's been a couple of weeks. Uh, we're going to keep with the format we've had. I'm going to start with a quick positive focus, something I just saw recently in, in a retirement journal. But some studies have come out recently showing that um, hobbies in retirement can prevent or significantly reduce the effects of depression in adults over 50. And when people leave work and go home, depression can be, a, can be an issue. So think about that. Uh, if you know people who are really into something, they just seem happier. So volunteer at your favorite charity, ride bikes, hike, play an instrument, roast coffee beans, um, dig out some old hobbies that you used to enjoy years ago before kids and work got in the way. Um, who knows, you may, you may find some, some new joy there. So getting down to the, uh, the material for the call, what I'd like to do is start with something that's um, it's probably worthy of being part of our introduction in every meeting in each one of these calls, and that's a restatement of HCM's prime directive. Now, I understand that uh, people who are Star Trek fans, um, that term prime directive may have some special meaning, but even if you don't know who Captain Kirk is, don't worry. The term prime directive is pretty self-explanatory. And it means sort of that, that one thing that we pursue above all else. And uh, at HCM, our, our prime directive is helping clients design customized retirement income plans so that they can uh, have sustainable withdrawals throughout their lifetimes. Now, by definition, that is a long-term objective, and it needs to be treated as such. And I think there's a lot of proof uh, in, in the wisdom in our process if you think about the imponderables that are consuming short-sighted people today. These include things like, well, obviously the, the uh, COVID pandemic, the shuttered economy, who's going to win the election, and um, you know, how that's going to affect people's pocketbooks, how will social unrest change things, the, the oil price collapse that happened uh, a little over a month ago and how the Federal Reserve and other global banks are going to respond and what's that going to mean to everybody. You know, the reality is when you think about it, we have no control over these things, but these worries consume people, they consume the news flow, and we simply can't predict their outcomes or their consequences. So we're probably best off to recognize this and move on. But this is the important part that I, I want to make. I'm sort of setting the stage to make this point because I, I wanted to go home, so I'm going to take a brief dramatic pause for emphasis here. It's important to realize that at HCM, we planned for these things five years ago. We just didn't know what we were planning for at the time, but we wanted to be prepared if something happened. And if nothing did happen, then our plans, the reserves that we had in place, things of that nature, would stay there to offer, for, offer protection when something finally did happen. So that is, I mean, that, that's why at HCM we have safety nets, we have bond ladders, and all these things have, uh, have five-year terms associated with them so that we can span, so that our plans span these types of events. So right now, you know, in the conversation, it, it, it sort of seems like we're planning for today, but 
we're not. That's short-sighted. Right now, we're planning for five years from now. This includes the portfolio planning that we're doing, the adjustments we're making, and during the next five years or so, the consequences of everything that's happening today regarding the pandemic, the economy, the, all the Federal Reserve action, all that's going to become clear over time, and we'll be able to adapt to that through our monitoring process. And I, I guess the moral of this story is um, that those who are trying to react to today's imponderable events in order to support them today have waited way, way too long to prepare. And that's why in the process that we follow um, at HCM, we're looking forward and that's why we have that prime directive. Now, with that out of the way, um, one of the things we've been uh, teaching clients for more than 30 years is that there are essentially three key variables uh, in a well-designed retirement plan, and and uh, these de and, and all of the details from the plan, so that there can be a myriad of, of details, but they all flow from these three main things. The they are essentially risk, amount, and time. So the first two of those, um, the first two of those, are uh, risk and amount, and those are variables that we have a fair amount of control over. The final one, time, we, have, we do have some control over, but less so. So I just want to address these and just briefly and how they fit into the plan, and then we'll get into the, the meat of the markets and so forth. So risk refers essentially to the, the, the various potential risks that would have financial implications um, for people during their, uh, during their retirement years as we're putting together a retirement income plan. And they range from things like health risks, which obviously everybody has some concern about, um, risks uh, around family matters. So if, if, uh, if people in the family are going to need financial assistance, um, and of course there's concerns with regard to um, risks in the market, uh, portfolio risks and so forth. In my experience though, the issues related to health risks um, uh, and, and potential support for children or parents, these are the ones that are most likely to create financial problems because the, the, the um, ones solve, the, that come out of the investment portfolios and so forth are fairly easy to deal with from a planning perspective because they tend to be cyclical. These other issues tend to come on and um, people, I guess I, I would say it's interesting to me that many people tend to worry um, a lot about the things that are easily managed, like the short-term volatility in the portfolios, and pay very little attention to the real threats um, to their financial independence, which again come primarily from health and, and family issues. I'm not suggesting these things don't matter because they do, but um, meaning the, uh, the the market issues. But again, they can be managed pretty easily. Um, it's much harder when you're dealing with uh, with those. Uh, bigger issues, again, family and so forth. When we're talking about amounts uh, and that risk amount and time component, um, we're talking about the amount that people save or spend. That's very easy to adjust in the planning process. Um, when we talk about time, you know, the timeline begins the day you're born and ends the day you die. Uh, the and so there's a certain amount of inflexibility because we certainly don't know the end point of the plan. Um, there is a lot of control people have. Uh, it's just not the same level as with the other variables. Um, certainly we can eat our vegetables, exercise. We can choose when we retire. Those are all things that have a bearing on the planning. Um, but we, so when, when it's all said and done, um, the objective of the prime directive is to make sure when we consider those three big variables and all the details that spill out of them is to make sure that we're maintaining a plan that have the odds of, of uh, a successful retirement income um, very high. I think that, so that's really what I wanted to cover um, there, so I think Doug now has a little bit to, to touch base on um, regarding the markets and so forth. So, Doug? Sure. 
Um, so it's been a few weeks uh, since our last call, uh, but the markets have kind of uh, continued to, to defy logic in the eyes of some and, and, and moved higher. Um, so, you know, off the heels of, of a period of, of 12 days where we had 10 up days out of 12 days, and, and of those two down days, uh, I think it was a, a 12 basis point and a 25 basis point move down, respectively. So. Uh, very aggressive move to the upside, which which kind of put the market in in an extremely overbought uh, condition. Um, last week, uh, on Thursday, you saw uh, a a very volatile down day, which basically eliminated a lot of that overbought condition. Uh, we saw the major indexes down anywhere from five and a half to seven percent. Um, there was a few headlines surrounding what caused that one. Uh, the, the increase in COVID cases that we've seen, uh, raising the possibility of a, of a second wave, and we'll, we'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, but there was also some concern around the, the question and answer portion uh, of the Fed's uh, press conference, more specifically, um, some pretty direct questions to, uh, to Chair Powell regarding, you know, is the Fed concerned about asset levels, and you know, what, what are they doing to kind of uh, respond to the idea that they're, they're, they're creating a, an environment that's, that's fostering some, some level of, of economic inequality? Um, you know, Powell kind of danced around the question, didn't really answer it. Uh, but then the following day, you know, you saw a, a pretty big sell-off. Um, but sure enough, three days later, uh, you had a market that rallied about 5 to 6%. Uh, and over the past few days, we've seen things settle down quite a bit. Um, the theme that we've touched on several times uh, during these calls remains in play, uh, and I think maybe more than ever, uh, which is kind of a, a noticeable diversion between the state of the market and the state of the economy. So uh, this morning, uh, Jer Jeremy Grantham, who was uh, you know, a legend in the, in the value investing field, uh, had a quote on CNBC, and I, I'm going to read it word for word because I think it, it kind of encapsulates this pretty well. So he said, it is, a, it is a rally without precedent, the fastest in this time ever, and the only one in history that takes place against a backdrop of undeniable economic problems. Um, you know, to highlight this, you've got uh, the P ratio of the U.S. market in the top 10% of history in terms of being overvalued, while you have the U.S. economy in the worst 10% or even perhaps the worst 1% uh, conditions that we've, that we've seen. So... I think a lot of people are scratching their head and saying, you know, what, what continues to drive this? Um, and we think it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. It, it, you know, the central bank's willingness to provide liquidity at almost every turn, and it's not just the Fed, it's, it's the ECB, it's the Bank of Japan, it's the Bank of England. Um, you know, the, the, the additions of purchase programs for almost the entire capital structure outside of equities, it's, it's really emboldened investors uh, to believe that risk in the market has has kind of been eliminated. Um, you know, you're you're getting a lot of uh, comparisons to the to the 2000 tech bubble, um, and you know, look no further than than a story out of uh, Hertz rental car company. So, not to go into too much detail on this, but but Hertz filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy uh, several weeks ago, which basically means that they've met. They've divvied up and decided what, what's going where, and essentially the equity remaining is worth nothing. Uh, it's still trading as a ticker, and you know if you, if you bought it for a dollar and sold it for three, great, you can still make money. But when this all stops, it will be worth absolutely nothing. So there had been kind of a retail day trading euphoria surrounding this, this particular ticker, and people started to take notice of it, uh, particularly some Wall Street banks. So some... Uh, um, they attempted to do the first uh, bankruptcy equity raise in the history of the market um, to try to literally lure unsuspecting investors to buy a worthless asset to then pass on to their creditors. Essentially, the SEC stepped in and said, this is predatory, we can't let this happen. But the fact that it was even floated as an idea and, and almost went through uh, kind of shows you the, the, the level of froth that we're seeing in some parts of the market. So. I think, you know, I don't know that history will be kind on what the Fed is doing five to ten years down the road, and I think it's up for debate. Um, you know, many are concerned that they're creating kind of an asset bubble of massive proportions, but 
for now, they've reiterated their commitment to continue and inject themselves into the market discussion. Um, so where does that leave us? So, so one of the things that many have been surprised by is the willingness for them to create this type of market environment, seemingly one where you know the definition of a market that's, in the chairman's words, properly functioning is one that goes up and vice versa. Um, so this backstop that's been created both you know, in, in a sense physical and some psychological um, has, has moved this rally past you know, critical levels from a technical standpoint. Um, you, know, you, you have market internals right now that would, would tell you that the, the health of the rally uh, is one that, that, that has a higher probability of being sustainable going forward, regardless of what the economy is saying. Um, so when we look at these two scenarios, um, you know, there's still a number of things that can provide headwinds going forward, you know, things that, that Mike alluded to, second wave, social unrest, political uncertainty, disappointing economic news, China relations, election, et cetera. But right now in this new normal, in a backwards type of way, bad news can actually be good news if it means the Fed is going to be more aggressive in their policies for longer. And I know that sounds very odd and unusual, but this, this is the market environment we're currently in. Um, so taking all of that into consideration, um, we've taken another step to adding back some risk to portfolios, uh, moving approximately 5% from, from the defensive side uh, to the equity side. Uh, and this, you know, this remains in line with our, our stated goal of getting portfolios back to clients target equity allocation, but we're still trying to do this in a measured way. Um, you know, we ultimately believe this approach remains appropriate based on the data that we have right now. Um, but we also know that there, there's strong cases to be made on both sides of the equation. So the situation remains extremely fluid, um, and we're, we're dealing with this kind of on a, on a day-by-day basis. Um, so, Mike, you mentioned earlier the, the rise in, in kind of this COVID second wave, so to speak. Can you, can you kind of talk a little bit about what you're seeing there, if you're concerned, or how that might affect things going forward? Um, yeah, well, I do have one question for you, though. Sure. When you talk about um, sort of bringing portfolios back to their neutral targets, we've taken a couple of steps there. What might the future – I realize it's, it hinges a little bit on how things unfold, but what might that look like if we stay on the path we're on? Sure. So I, I think it would look you know, similar to what you would see in, in maybe a dollar-cost averaging situation where you're you know, going at, at time intervals – um, to add additional risk to the portfolio. Now, if we saw some kind of significant downside flush that we thought was maybe a little bit overdone, we might accelerate that process. Or if things really start to run away and get overbought again, we might take a step back and say, okay, we're going to sit tight on this or even maybe rebalance portfolios to their, to their current models. Um, so you know, that, that, I think, is the best way to think about this uh, you know, right now. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so getting uh, back to the, the question of where we stand um, with the COVID-19 situation, um, we have seen infection rates spike. Obviously, this has been in the news, no secret to anybody, most notably in some of the southern states. Uh, we've seen it in Texas, Florida, Arizona. Some of this, the state officials there are starting to rethink their opening strategies. Uh, the, the, probably the biggest news recently has been in Beijing, China. Uh, they're experiencing a new surge, and they've taken some pretty draconian steps sort of back into where we were a couple of months ago to help suppress um, the outbreak. They're closing schools, canceling airline flights, doing lockdowns in, in particular areas. So the, the question um, I think that we're, we all think about when we see this is, um, how how will this be treated here if we see another more broad resurgence? And the attitude around the virus seems to have changed somewhat um, now that we have more data uh, and and the, the medical community has a better idea on how to handle COVID cases. The, the fatality rate seems to be much lower than was originally feared. And government officials are saying that they're uh, likely uh, would would be reluctant to go into another shutdown situation, even if new cases exploded. However, the reality is, if we did have that surge in new cases, I suspect that um, P 
people would sort of take it into their own hands and sort of and quickly revert back into a quarantine type mentality on their own if things got particularly bad. Um, if that happened, of course, it could certainly or would certainly put a dent in the trajectory of the economic recovery uh, and potentially put another ripple in the markets. This is one of those risks that we plan for um, when when we keep these uh, sort of protective measures always in place in, in the uh, in the back of the portfolios. If that does happen, though, we would likely see more stimulus. So we we sort of have a roadmap now. If you think back to uh, the 2008-2009 crisis. Um, we, we saw what the government did in terms of um, uh, stimulus, and most recently, obviously, we saw them step up to the plate. I suspect that we would see that again with with additional stimulus. There's certainly already political discussion about around four, um, and that would probably be accelerated. As Doug was alluding to before, in a perverse way, that could actually be good for the markets over the short run. And I think we have no doubt from market history that there's going to be a price to be paid for for all of this uh, stimulus money that has gone into the markets. However, that may have to wait until the economy needs to stand on its own because the these central banks around the world regularly declare themselves as being ready, willing, and able to, to keep up um, the infusion of this stimulus money as long as these threats exist as a result of the COVID crisis. So while there is likely a day of reckoning, it may well be um, reasonably far out into the future. Um, speaking, Doug, did you have something about reopening you wanted to mention? Sure. So, you know, as, as we see states continue to open back up and, and attempt to get back to normal, um, I think one of the things that's gonna come out of this uh, assuming that we don't get a massive second wave that shuts everything back down, um, is you're going you're gonna to continue to see what I would call fun with numbers headlines. Um, so what these are is, you know, they're going to be headlines that will tout these massive percentage gains, probably records, um, and they're going to get extrapolated to, quote-unquote, confirm that a V-shaped recovery is underway. Um, percentages are pretty easy to increase when they start from zero, uh, and, and that's what we're seeing with a lot of these month over month numbers. Um, I, I think if we're being honest, the absolute numbers, the absolute levels of these numbers remain significantly depressed across the board. Um, look no further than the initial claims. Uh, we're almost three months into this crisis uh, and we're still seeing 1.5 million people filing initial unemployment claims. Uh, to put that in perspective, adding all of the claims data that we've seen over the past three months, that comes to, I believe, uh, 40, close to 45 million people total. Um, the average peak, weekly peak, that you see during a recession is 500 to 600,000. So um, we're, we're really nowhere near the, the type of V recovery, I think, in, in the employment figure that, that a lot of hope are, are hoping for. Um, the Q2 numbers are expected to be historically bad across the board, both earnings uh, and GDP. I, I think that at this point is already being expected, so I don't think that'll be a shock to anybody. Um, but you know, I guess with uh, with that said, there are some encouraging signs that things are moving in the right direction. Uh, but from our perspective, we we still believe that this is going to take much longer than people think. Um, and, and so far, this has all kind of been overridden. Uh, by the by, the fiscal and monetary stimulus programs that we've seen, um, but the question really is: Is there going to come a point where the weight of the recessionary economy finally becomes too much for the the Fed to essentially hold over its head? Um, th this continues to be a concern for us as we go into the summer months and we we see the the PPP loans and the extended unemployment benefits set to expire. And I know you know throughout the market. You know, many strategists are concerned about this and, and have kind of kind of dug their heels in almost in disbelief, saying that this can't continue to can't continue indefinitely. Um, but there is a there is a famous saying that's just don't don't fight the Fed. And um, 
certainly a, a lot of people have attempted to do that unsuccessfully uh, over the past uh, past few months. So, you know, we're certainly seeing signs of things improving, but I think from a from a perspective that we're going to see a, see a V-shaped recovery in the economy, um, I, I'm still of the belief that that's not going to happen, even though we've essentially seen a V-shaped recovery in the market. Okay, so uh, I think that probably does it for our sort of formal outline. I, I want to just reemphasize the fact that um, just a reminder of my my initial point that the the planning for now was done several years ago. The planning that we're doing now is for several years from now. And I think that that really fits into the, the sort of the long-term nature of, of how we approach this process. I think, though, Doug, did you have some questions that came in? Yeah, so one, one that I saw, which, which I think is, is a good one, um, you know, we're hearing a lot about both deflation and inflation, kind of, you know, what the effects of those would be on, uh, you know, market conditions. Uh, I think that we've kind of been in a deflationary environment for a while. Um, you know, deflation usually comes in the form of excess debt that's, that's unproductive. Um, it, you know, it, it kind of puts a, puts a, uh, you know, a boulder uh, around your neck, so to speak, and, and prevents you from, from kind of growing your business. Um, and I think as the Fed is trying to continue to lower rates, they're, they're doing their best to, to fight those deflationary forces. The one that I think is, is picking up more steam uh, is the inflation side, because you've got the Fed basically printing money out of thin air and, and putting it into the, to the system. Um, but I think the one thing to consider in all this is if, if we see any kind of significant unexpected inflation, that's probably the one thing that could really put uh, a damper on what the central banks are trying to do because it would, would essentially cap their ability to create liquidity at such a massive rate. Um, w- you know, Because if they continue to do that, they would run the risk of, of hyperinflation the dollar falling, and, and that's that's not a scenario that, that anyone would want to see. Um, and it would almost be, you know, put them in a bind to where they may have to actually raise rates uh, instead of continuing to cut them. Uh, and what we've seen is uh, in an environment where the market seemingly depends on these constant temporary emergency measures, um, you know, uh, a regime of, of rate rises and tightening financial conditions would, would not be conducive uh, to, to further uh, growth in the equity market. So um, we're not seeing those numbers yet, but it's certainly something to keep in the back of your mind. Do you have another, or was that it? Uh, it looks like that's it for now. All righty. Um, all righty, folks, just to, to follow up on, on uh, you know, what Doug is saying, the, the, the notion of the Fed giving – is really what seems to be behind. That's sort of the the additional variable that's overwhelming the economic difficulties that we're seeing in in sort of the the real-world economy. Rising interest rates, if they were doing it intentionally, would be one of the ways that they would begin to take back some of this stimulus. The concern would be that if, if the market delivers that same force, it could have the same essential consequences and that would probably not be a good thing. Um, in the meantime, uh, over, so our, our next call right now is planned for uh, Thursday, July 16th. Obviously, if news breaks, uh, we will be reaching out to you and scheduling a call sooner. Uh, in that interim, um, if things stay on course, Doug, is it fair to say that we'll likely be making another incremental increase to move the portfolios back to neutral? Uh, yeah, I would, I would say that. But so far, that's that's the plan, right? Yeah. Now. So that would be the plan. Um, so as always, if you have any questions between calls um, or need any help, or if there's any, anybody that you know or care about that could use a hand, let us know. We will do whatever we can. Otherwise, that does it for today. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>